directly involved in the society of his time. And the society of his time is very similar from various viewpoints to the society in which we live today. At least that is something that the Islamists have got right when they say that indeed this uh, society, the world, the geopolitical situation of the world today uh, can somehow be compared to the geopolitical situation at the beginning of the 14th century. When uh, you have the Mongols ruling Iran and Central Asia and threatening the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt, invading Syria in 1299-1300, then converting to Shiism around 1306 with al Jai II, and then threatening again uh, to invade Syria and Egypt around uh, 1310. And it is under that threat of a world power that is threatening the Muslim world in its existence that indeed Ibn Taymiyyah operates. The Crusaders are over they came to an end in 1291. And they were not that important. They didn't threaten uh, the Muslim world in its existence. The Mongols did. But then the Mongols converted to Islam. In 1295, Ghazan, the Ilkhan ruler of Iran, converts to Islam. But he still wants to destroy the Mamluk Sultanate. So what do we do in Syria? when we have those new Muslim rulers in the East still threatening to invade this traditionally Muslim country, Syria and Egypt. Ibn Taymiyyah will propose a theology <coughs> of war. He will start saying that they are not real Muslims. They converted, but in fact, they are still ruling on the basis of the great law of Genghis Khan, the Yasa or Yasa, and uh, not on the basis of the Sharia. So they are not real Muslims, and so we should fight them. And those three Mongol, three anti-Mongol fatwas that were written by Ibn Taymiyyah at the beginning of the 14th century have become in the 20th century probably the most widely read text by Ibn Taymiyyah among Muslim extremists and terrorists. You find them, quote, you find those anti-Mongol fatwas quoted by Abdes Salam Faraj in Egypt, the electrician who is behind the assassination of President Sadat in 1981. You find those three anti-Mongol fatwas quoted in Algeria by Ali Belhaj the number two of the Islamic Salvation Front in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, during the civil war in Algeria. You find them quoted by Osama bin Laden. So they are a very widely read text, but they are totally misunderstood. Because Ibn Taymiyyah developed this takfir, theology against an invader, an invader that had turned towards Shiism, that was famous for the massacres it had committed in Damascus in 1299 and in 1300, while it was occupying Damascus. As for Ibn Taymiyyah's relation to the Mamluks, and the Mamluks were, as you know, ethnically also from Central Asia, for most of them. There were also Turks or Tatars who had been given a bit of Islam and a bit of Arabic when they were given power in Egypt. But they were not that more faithful to the Sharia than the Mongols themselves. But towards them, Ibn Taymiyyah was always faithful, even when they were putting him in jail. The young Sultan and Nasser Mohammed, son of Qalawun, under whom he lived, he calls in some work the renovator of the religion in his time, Mujaddid al-Din, or Muhyi al-Din, 
renovator of the religion. So he's totally loyal. So when you read Usama bin Laden, Ali Belihaj, or Abdel Salam Faraj, you see that they say, for example, to Sadat or to the Algerian generals, you do not rule according to the Sharia. You rule on the basis of foreign laws inherited from French colonization in Algeria or uh, imposed by America uh, and leading you to go to Jerusalem in the case of Sadat. So you do not rule on the basis of the Sharia, but you rule on the basis of imported other uh, laws. So you are not a Muslim. So we have to fight you. So that's what I've called Mongolizing Islamism. Because it's an Islamism that assimilates the rulers of Muslim countries to the Mongol invaders. It Mongolizes them. But it's a misreading of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah was always loyal towards its own Mamluk rulers. Because that's one of the basic principles of the Sharia, which is not uh, specific to Ibn Taymiyyah, particular to him, but which you find uh, among all the different schools. You cannot rebel, you cannot take arms against your own rulers. Why? Because the companions pledge allegiance to the Prophet on the basis of three engagements. We will obey. We like it or we do not like it. We will obey. We will not dispute the authority of those who exert it. But we will say the truth or we will stand up for the truth without fearing being blamed by anybody. But there is a difference between opening your big mouth and taking your Kalashnikov and killing Sadat or starting a civil war. Ibn Taymiyyah was never, never in favor of any kind of tyrannicide. And those Islamists who <coughs> in the 20th century have assimilated the rulers of Muslim countries to the Mongols using the anti-Mongol fatwas of Ibn Taymiyyah have basically uh, made a confusion between external policy and internal policy. They have considered the kind of theology he had developed in a fatwa for a very particular reason, to mobilize Syria against the invaders. They have considered that it was the basis for his relation with his own rulers. And that those texts could indeed be used today to dispute the Islamic character of the rulers of Muslim countries. That was Mongolizing Islamism. Supposedly, even Tamir was called condoning tyranny. In fact, he was not. He was condoning, yes, resistance against invaders, but he always kept totally loyal to the Mamluks his own rulers. And he's very clear. He says, 60 years of an unjust, uh, uh, despotic ruler or imam are better than a knight without imam. It's the most traditional loyalist approach that you have in even time as you have in generally the other classical thinkers of Islam. Because when you start civil war, you know where it starts, you don't know how it ends. And very often, he explains, you think that by starting fighting a ruler, you will be able to correct the evils that you are uh, <coughs> refusing in those rulers. But in fact, the harm that you are going to do by taking arms against those rulers is much bigger than the evils that you are trying to correct. And he will say, and you can read it in the book, among other statements, he will say that you can even start any kind of crusade, 
let's use that uh, terminology, any kind of moral crusade if there is no chance of success. If the expected collateral damage is worse than the harm you are trying to find a solution to. For everything, you need tadabur. You need to go for the lesser evil. And lesser evil sometimes means being patient. And he is very clear. He speaks then in an autobiographical way. And he says, if indeed you are forced by a ruler, by a power, to change your views on the religion, and you accept to do so, then you are not faithful to the religion. But if refusing to uh, share the views of the power leads the power to jail you, to harm you, to beat you, to imprison you, that's the way God deals with his prophets and those who follow them. So you have this so-called father of the Islamic revolution or spiritual ancestor of Islamism that says if indeed you are forced to change your ideas and you do not accept that and you are then harmed for your ideas and you are in prison and you are jailed and even if you are killed, that's the way God deals with his prophets and those who follow them and that's the way you should go. It's very clear. You have, from this point of view, rather than condoning tyranny seed, you have all the texts you need in Ibn Taymiyyah for civil disobedience and accepting martyrdom in defense of your ideas. It's not taking your Kalashnikov. It is accepting to die. And he goes further and he says, and those ideas are not specific to him. You find them among all the classical, most of the classical uh, thinkers of Islam. And he says, and if you are forced by some system to kill somebody else, but yourself you know that this order is unjust, you have to refuse obeying that order. And if it means that you are going to be killed, so be it. Your life is not worth more than the life of the person that you were asked to kill. So it's not just passive resistance there. <laughs> it is passive resistance to the point of accepting self-sacrifice. And Somehow I was speaking with friends about that and they were saying, no wonder they don't teach us those texts in Muslim countries very often. <laughs> That's exactly the kind of text they don't want us to hear about. But those are the texts that you have in this guy who is supposed to be an extremist. That's for the first accusation. The second accusation of uh, Natana de Longbass is uh, the so-called strict division of the world into Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb. It's this accusation which I studied in this book and uh, in the French version it was called Margin because it's a very, very famous fatwa by Ibn Taymiyyah. You know Mardin is this lovely little city in southeastern Turkey today. In the time of Ibn Taymiyyah, it was a little satellite state, the satellite of the Mongol Empire of Iran. The rulers of Mardin were Muslims, but uh, they were part of the Mongol Empire of Iran. Population was mixed, Muslim and non-Muslim. And Ibn Taymiyyah is asked, is Mardin part of Dar al-Islam, or is it part of Dar al harb are we allowed to start attacking Mardin? And even Tanya answers, Mardin is not part of Dar al-Islam, and it's not part of Dar al harb It has a third status, Hum Talit Murakkab. It has a composite status, which means that 
in a very precise case, we have there a text by him showing that already in his time he considers that this division of strict division of the world into two different spheres is irrelevant. Situations in which he lives are far more complex, and this division is based on uh, the work of some jurists. It's not canonical, and in many places we will have situations that are more complex. And then when you look for other texts about ahkam al-diyar, the status of places, are places part of the Dar al-Islam or part of the Dar al hab Should we fight them or uh, can we consider them as part of uh, the world of Islam? What does he answer? He, he says, ahkam al-diyar, the status of places, differ, vary, according to the states of the heart of the people who live in it. Ahwal al-ahkam al-diyar tatagayyar bihazb ahwal qulub subkaniha. Ahwal qulub subkaniha. The state, the spiritual states of the heart of the people who live in those places. That's what he takes into consideration. And that uh, position, which has nothing to do with what very often Islamists in the 20th century have said. And in uh, this book, in which I have translated and studied uh, uh, Mardin's fatwa, the fatwa of Mardin by Ventania, also looked at a few uh, modern authors to see how they were using it. For example, Mohammed Abdel Salam Faraj, the same Egyptian electrician I have already referred to. But also, Abdallah Azzam was the mentor of Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. Also, the Sheikh Abdel Aziz al Jarbour of Saudi Arabia, and two others. And I look at the way they have understood that Mardin Fatwa. And it's very funny to see that some of those Islamist thinkers who have great respect for Ibn Taymiyyah have even greater difficulties with him about this fatwa because they can't accept it. Because uh, they have a very political understanding of what an Islamic state should be. And they misunderstand what Ibn Taymiyyah says in that uh, Mardin fatwa. Because uh, to justify that Mardin is not part of the Dar al-Islam. He says Mardin is not, has not the status of a Dar al-Islam because a Dar al-Islam al-Islam. Dar al-Islam would mean that Ahkam al-Islam, the rules of Islam, are implemented in that place. So you look on the CD-ROMs of the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah, and you try to find what he means by Ahkam al-Islam. And for him, Ahkam al-Islam is the right for a Muslim to have his body washed when he dies and to be buried in a Muslim cemetery and similar things. Problem is that all 20th century Islamists consider that Ahkam al-Islam means Hukumat Islamiyah. So they slip from the status, the rules of Islam, towards, uh, towards an Islamic government. And so they have great difficulties because their understanding is that to have a realm of Islam, you need to have an Islamic government. They have great difficulties with those texts of Ibn Taymiyyah, in which Ibn Taymiyyah says that, in fact, uh, the status of place vary according to the states of the hearts of the people who live in it. It's nothing to do with the ruling, the political system ruling that place. But we have a politicization of the thought of Ibn Tanya, which is totally unfaithful to his understanding. In fact, his understanding of reality, his approach to reality, is religious, ethical. It's not really political. 
And, but we take politics for granted, as if it was the only window through which to look at reality. We take, for example, uh, the work of Ibn Taymiyyah, to mean uh, a political regime. Siyasa doesn't mean politics. Sasal ibil means he led the camels to the place where they would drink. It's nothing to do with police in the Greek sense. So a siyasa shara'iya is the guidance of the community on the way of the prophet. That's what more or less it means. In his case, the exa an example he gives uh, to explain what siyasa means, he says it's like a shepherd. A shepherd cannot claim to be a shepherd if he is not followed by his sheep. Similarly, a sais or a raiz cannot claim to develop a siyasa if indeed he is not followed by people. And we have there another approach to politics uh, than uh, what those Islamists and also Orientalists make in, say, the 20th century. But to come back to the second accusation by Nathanana de Longbass, it's obvious that she didn't read the Mahdin Fatwa. But if she had read the Mahdin Fatwa, it would become very difficult for her to say that for Ibn Tanya, the world is indeed divided strictly in those two different spheres. No, the situation is more complex than that. And then the third accusation is that he is some kind of professional mukafir, calling people unbelievers as soon as they do not share his own ideas. Come on. Have you read his fatwa on the calendar? The calendars are the Sufi hippies of the 14th century, to make it short. They are the guys who do not follow any kind of religious uh, prescription or a societal uh, rule. They go around naked, covered uh, uh, with tattoos or piercings uh, because uh, that shows that they are suffering out of love for the Lord, uh, not respecting anything, uh, living in cemeteries, uh, shaved completely, even eyebrows and eyelashes. Uh, very, very unconventional, to say the least. And even Tanya is asked, what do we do with those guys? And he starts in his fat on the calendars, which is translated in the book here. Uh, he starts by saying, yeah, of course, they are not, uh, they are not really Muslims. And there are so many like them. But then, instead of continuing in that direction, uh, which would lead to the takfir, etc., he says, in fact, if there are so many like them, it's because the ulama, the scholars, are not doing their job properly. It's because they li we live in a time uh, where uh, the effects of prophethood have uh, called down. And, uh, in fact, we live in a time which can be uh, illustrated by this hadith, Sahih, which I call the hadith of the forefathers. A time will come when we will know nothing anymore of the religion. We will not know prayer. We will not know how to fast. We will not know about pilgrimage. We will not know anything of the religion. We will just remember that our forefathers were saying, there is no God but God. Not even that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And some companion said to the Prophet, oh, that will not help them. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, answered three times. It will save them from the fire. It will save them from the fire. It will save them from the fire. So just a time will come when people will know nothing of the religion anymore, but only remember that their forefathers were monotheists of some kind, and that will save them from the fire. And instead of pursuing into the takfir, into the anatomization of the calendars, Ibn Taymiyyah prefers to go that way, and saying, in fact, 
if you have new converts to Islam who are not practicing the religion properly, if you have people who were born far away in the steppe, like the Mongols, far away from the centers of Islamic knowledge, you can not call them unbelievers. You have to educate them. And he goes further. And he says, you can never call anybody an, an unbeliever unless not only you have all the reasons to do so, but also you have answered all the objections against doing so. Which is another program. You can have many reasons, you must have all the reasons. But if there is any objection against calling somebody an unbeliever, because he hasn't got the required education, because he is new in the faith, because he is uh, uh, going through uh, bad times, because, and you can add all the circumstances that should t be taken into account, you can not condemn him in any way. And we have there, in that fatwa, on the calendars, a treatise on tolerance. And in fact, and the uh, final position of Ibn Taymiyyah on this question is exactly the same that you have in Al Ghazali. If you read, for example, the Faisal al Tafriqa by Al Ghazali, who dies in 1111 and is translated uh, into English, uh, the, uh, the Limits of Boundaries by Chairman Jackson, uh, Al Ghazali says, In the takfir fi khata, amma sukut fala khata afi. In calling somebody an unbeliever, there is a risk, there is a danger. In keeping silent, there is none. And that's, in fact, is also the position of Ibn Tani. Uh, who advocated the use of force against non muslims So that's a question. It's a question of jihad. Uh, independently of the uh, spiritual aspects of uh, jihad, which I will come to in a minute, uh, Ibn Tani is, is utilitarian is a pragmatist. You cannot start any kind of jihad if there is no chance to win it. Okay? Uh, you cannot go into any kind of armed conflict if you are just a little group. Because it doesn't make sense. So those are just practical reasons. And then uh, when we go for a more spiritual one, uh, the um, the uh, hadith it refers about jihad is the hadith authentic, unlike the one of the lesser and the greater jihad, which is not authentic. Uh, it's the hadith which says, "Afdalul jihad kalimat hal amam sultan jari." Uh, the most eminent jihad is to speak the truth in front of a despotic sultan. Kalimat hal. So that's what he calls and the greatest jihad. And then uh, he doesn't deny that, uh, and it would be uh, well, uh, not honest for Muslims to deny it, that uh, like other uh, religious or ideological communities or societies, we believe that there are some values that at some point, uh, if all other means have been exhausted, uh, deserve to be defended. Uh, by the use of force, if the all other options have failed, okay, and in different cases. And he looks at jihad uh, as a continuum, and he says, in fact, we have to start with toba, repenting, because that's jihad and nafs. It's fighting against our own sins. That's what we have to start doing. And from Toba, we can go to Hijra. Hijra as fleeing away from our own sins and fleeing away from sinners, putting some distance between them and us. And if indeed we are able to do so, perhaps correcting them, 
and then from Toba we go to Hijra, and from Hijra we go to Amr bil Ma'aruf, Wallahi Amil Munkar, commanding good and forbidding evil. With our heart, with our tongue, or with our hand. And then that can lead as a continuum, as a long spectrum, towards uh, jihad in a military sense. But you have had to go through all this spectrum first before reaching that option. And then he says, if you go for jihad for any other reason, then to make the word of God the most important, the highest, this is not jihad. If you go for jihad because you are angry, that's not jihad. If you go for jihad because of any kind of emotional reason, that's not jihad. If you go for jihad because of any kind of material reason, that's not jihad. So, you know, before going into jihad, after looking at all the practical reasons uh, uh, and looking at the spiritual aspects of it, I think that there are many, many things that any kind of Muslim who would think about jihad would have to deal with before going into that kind of behavior. I remember I had, while I was living in Oxford, I had at some point uh, access at some uh, documents of uh, the British anti-terrorist police. They asked me to look at some documents. Uh, they were, in fact, transcripts of uh, conversations in a terrorist cell that had been bugged. I looked at it as if they were medieval documents. They wanted uh, a report on that. You can find it on internet. You type on Google, Michel report. Uh, the lawyer of uh, those uh, guys put it on the internet. And they asked me for a report. And those conversations were very interesting because uh, the, the guru, the cell leader, uh, who was trying to transform his uh, followers into some kind of Muslim Schwarzeneggers to send them to Afghanistan, supposedly, uh, uh, was always complaining that they would come late to the meetings. <laughs> And so he would say, you should realize that if you want to be a mujahid, first you should come on time. <laughs> uh, because the etiquette is part of jihad. The adab is part of jihad, and you have to start with that. At least there he was right. <laughs> At least there he was right. But uh, some of his followers were also right, because uh, when he was... Uh, uh, when he was telling them, we are going to go for some jogging with 15 kilos on our back and uh, try to be serious, not five kilos like last time, uh, make it seriously. Uh, you read in the transcript, someone must raise his finger and say, come to go fishing instead. <laughs> and so uh, they are not interested in jihad, they just want some uh, collective entertainment uh, for uh, young Muslim males between 20 and 30. So, uh, but uh, you can read the report on the internet if you're interested. It shows you that jihad is a serious thing. It's a serious thing. It's not just uh, because you are angry, because there is some injustice, starting, going, uh, killing everybody. That's not jihad. That's de dealing in a bad way with your own psychological problems. Uh, to come back, even ten years uh, taking part in jihad, yes. Uh, when, while the Mongols are occupying Damascus without taking the citadel after uh, their uh, victory at Wadi al Khazinda at the end of 1299, so they are for a few months occupying Damascus, but not the citadel that, which they cannot take. Uh, even Tanya is the heart of uh, the uh, the machine resistance against the uh, invader and the occupant. He is, he is famous for having gone to uh, Hazan, who is camping outside of the city. That's where he will meet uh, the, uh, uh, not only Hazan, but uh, his famous vizier, the Ilkhanid historian Rashiduddin Fazlallah al-Hamadani, 
and also uh, different Mughal commanders, he will obtain the liberation of the uh, Muslim and non-Muslim prisoners. And it's a famous uh, episode. Uh, if you look at the Musel Salah that has been produced, I think by the Qatari TV or some uh, other uh, uh, Gulf state about the life of Ibn Taymiyyah, it's a totally stupid uh, a thing that they have done. Uh, they show Ibn Taymiyyah speaking to the Mongol uh, uh, occupier of Damascus and uh, the Mongol ask him, and why do you want me to uh, release uh, the you know, uh, Zimma, uh, the Zimmis, not only the Muslims? And even ten years made to answer, oh, لِأَنَّهُمْ مِنْ أَهْلُ وَطَنِينَ Because they are people of our own uh, country, they are compatriots. It's stupid. We have the text by himself in which he says, yes, I said, because لِأَنَّهُمْ مِنْ أَهْلُ الظِّمَّةِينَ because there are people under protection. But you see, Arab modern nationalism even uh, <laughs> switches the historical reality uh, from a uh, religious uh, re answer, which makes sense, to a nationalistic uh, modern one, which doesn't make sense. And then the second time he directly took arm was for the Battle of Shakhab in 1302, uh, when the Mongols come back and this time will be defeated. And even Tanya is famous then for having uh, given the permission uh, uh, for the Muslim uh, uh, Mamluks not to fast because the battle was taking place during Ramadan. And he said in a fatwa, eat properly, drink properly, uh, and you'll do another day of fasting later. But you need to be strong for the battle. And he took, he, he, uh, he was on the battlefield himself. So those two uh, moments of resistance in Damascus and then its participation in that battle are famous. Uh, what do we do with uh, correct government uh, well, to try to improve government? We open a big mouth. From this point of view, uh, uh, the difference between the way uh, Egyptians got rid of Sadat and got rid of Mubarak is fantastic. It seems that in 30 years they have gone from a kind of revolution that was very similar to French or Russian revolution uh, to what an Islamic revolution is, which is you open your big mouth, you demonstrate, uh, you get killed if necessary, but you do not take up arms against your own rulers. And when you compare uh, uh, that uh, well, the end of Sadat was killed, assassinated, and the end of Mubarak, there is a big improvement in the Islamization of uh, Egyptian societies and their understanding of political Islam. And this time it seems to have worked. That's uh, Dar al Harb and uh, waging, you know, I would go there from uh, uh, even time yet to one of his best modern uh, scholars, which is Sheikh Qardawi. Sheikh Qardawi who says, What sense does it make to call to war against uh, some enemy when you have to buy your weapons from that enemy? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And so that's a pragmatic reason, among others. Uh, and it's surely not some groups uh, that, have, uh, that have the authority to call for jihad. In his case, in his, uh, at the beginning of the 14th century, he believes in some kind of cooperation between the Fuqaha and or the Ulama and uh, the uh, Umara, the Emirs. Uh, but he reminds the Emirs that they in fact uh, have no other authority than the authority which is recognized to them by the people. <coughs> and it says you cannot claim to be an Imam if there is nobody praying behind you. 
You cannot claim to be in charge as a ruler if nobody follows you. So you better develop some kind of cooperation with your so-called subjects. And at the end of the day, it must be a collective decision. And this collective decision, although it can be uh, led or implemented by the emirs, uh, will uh, always have to be also uh, based on the fact that an emir is nothing without the people who have given, recognized to him the power that he is exerting on, upon them. And that's why, uh, that's another uh, famous formula, you know, uh, at some point he says, you are not an emir, you are an ajvir, which means you get a salary from me. That's what uh, he considers an emir is. An emir has no divine power to rule, he's just under contract with the community, and that's how the relation should be between uh, the emir and the people who are more commanded by him. And so the decision to go into jihad will have to be taken by the authorities, but if the authorities are not followed by the people, so all that, you know, uh, we have taken for granted that political Islam, as was uh, uh, developed during the 20th century, was faithful to Islam, or faithful to Ibn Taymiyyah, among other things. I think that there is a lot of text that should also be taken into consideration. And uh, I have alluded to some, but you have within not only an empowerment of uh, the community, but also an empowerment of individuals. Because uh, on the last day, it is individuals who will meet their lord. It's not a government. It's just everybody. And again, uh, those are texts that he writes in the Minhaj Sunnah against uh, the uh, absolutism of the Mongols. He says, just remember the prophet. He's before him. We have this uh, he is the last prophet. He is uh, the Sayyid al-Bashar. He is the, the master of humans. And he is told by his Lord uh, to uh, be good and not to be a, to have a hard heart with them because they would go away from him if he is too hard with them. And himself then says, you take me for an arbitration. One of the two of you is more eloquent than the other. And uh, I might give uh, a right uh, to one of you who doesn't deserve it. But he has been more eloquent than the other. So if that is the case, let him know that I have given him nothing else but a part of the fire of Jehemim. Which means that instead of imposing his authority, he is asking us at the last, uh, at the end of the day, to use our own judgment and the purity of our heart. Every order, every decision that we are submitted to cannot be implemented automatically. It must transit through our own pure heart and purity of intention because it is not uh, the authority that will be judged, it is us. And there can't be any obedience to a creature while disobeying God. If that is not a very modern type, empowerment of individual conscience, I don't know what it is. But it goes in parallel with a disempowerment of authorities. And then, I don't know how you can have some kind of Islamic government that would, improve, uh, that would impose a particular reading of the religion. He says, very interestingly, look, rulers are obliged by Islam to protect the non-Muslim minorities, the al -Zimma. It is one of the duties of Muslim rulers to protect those non-Muslim communities living among them. 
So even more so, it is one of the duties of the rulers to protect Muslims from each other by making sure that diversity of opinion is implemented. No Muslim group having any kind of right to impose its views on the others. And the rulers, instead of imposing his own reading of the religion, has got to impose the respect of diversity of opinion. Why does he say that? Hmm? So he can take a, a right this? Yeah. Where? I can give you my French translation. It's, it's going to be published. But uh, I, I think it's in the Minhaj as soon. Uh, no, no, no. That one is in the, it's in the Majmul Fatawa. It's uh, the text he writes in jail during the last two years of his life. OK. First, about Ali. I'm not a specialist of uh, the uh, criticism of Hadith. But his, uh, his main position is that the uh, Tartib el uh, the hierarchy of eminence of the four uh, well guided caliphs, corresponds to the uh, historical order of succession. So the most eminent for him is Abu Bakr, then Omar, then Uthman, then Ali. That is for him very clear. So the order of succession corresponds to the order of eminence. And that's the main principle, and it's perhaps on that basis then that he will question the authenticity of a few hadiths. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, appoint, so-called appointment in Khadir e Khom, etc. It will be say, no, they are not authentic, or uh, he doesn't accept the Islam, but uh, I, I, I haven't studied that in particular. So, uh, about his uh, Sufism, that's much uh, clearer. He has the greatest respect for El Jilani, yes. He comments uh, on the Futur al Raib of El Jilani. Uh, he has a difficulty about El Hallaj, because, you know, El Hallaj, who was executed in 922, uh, El Jilani said, uh, El uh, القاتل مشتهد والمقتول شهيد. The the one who executed El Hallaj was a mujahid and mushtahid, and uh, the victim was a martyr. Even Tanya has a difficulty with that, especially as it is coming from El Jilani. He has also difficulty with El Jilani saying, "If I had been there, I would help. I would have helped El Hallaj, and he would not have slipped." So, uh, his love for Abdel Qadir is not unconditional. It is informed, it is great, but it's not unconditional. In fact, his un somehow unconditional uh, respect f is for the early Sufis, uh, pre Bastani, pre Junaid, uh, those that we have uh, somehow very little. Uh, literature about like uh, Bish Hafi, uh, Sarit Sapati, uh, all those were uh, uh, first and second century uh, ascetics. Those he has the greatest respect for. Was he himself a Qadiri affiliated to a Tariqa as a Magdisi as claimed? Not everybody agrees with Magdisi's argument. Uh, what I find far more interesting is what himself says about tasting the sweetness of the faith. And you have a language which is of a very high spiritual value when he starts speaking about love of God and being loved by God and the necessity to taste the sweetness of the faith, not just ordained formally to the prescriptions of the religion. I don't know what the Sufism is. I don't know if that is Sufism, but I know that that is very deep spirituality. But the question is indeed, what is Sufism? Because there are so many different dimensions. In his case, I would say, the kind of Sufism for him uh, would be, you want to fly high? Go deeper into the Sharia. Then you'll fly high.
Oh.